Hey guys, I uh, hope y'all are doing all right. I hope you're doing uh, healthy things, keeping your hands washed, not going out unnecessarily, all that jazz uh, while you are in the solitude of your homes. Uh, Miss Dockery asked me if I wouldn't mind doing one of these uh, videos for your class and uh, I've enjoyed being part of your class so I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, so uh, I'm going to do this one today. Uh, we're going to be looking at a couple uh, different uh, of your uh, iCivic sheets. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so that you can kind of follow along as well. Um, but this one what we're going to start off with, uh, the one that's uh, about the presidential agenda. Um, if you are in my group, have followed me into the other room, uh, you know how I kind of do things. I might pause every now and then, suggest something for you to underline or highlight or circle or whatever and i'm going to do that this one may not have too much of that because it's just one sheet um but i'll try to point out a few things as well or as we go through things um so uh, i'm going to start reading uh, y'all follow along and we'll get through this so the presidential agenda one of the many hats a president wears is that of agenda setter but what does that really mean a presidential agenda is a set of policy goals and priorities the president wants to achieve during his or her term in office. As you know, the job of making laws or policy falls to Congress, leaving the president in the position to sign or veto them once the bills are passed. But this doesn't mean that the president can't use the influence of the office to persuade and promote the kind of bills that meets his or her goals. So he's got a goal that he wants to reach. He may not necessarily be able to choose all the laws that go into effect, but he or she can still, you know, uh, use their power to direct the direction that Congress and that he or she will go in. Where it all begins. The agenda starts to form during the presidential election cycle, and now even earlier when the primary hopefuls try to stand out from the crowd of rivals within their own party. These policy goals and big ideas act as their platform when they run for the office and inform how they intend to serve in the new position. Many see these promises made to the American voters. If you vote for me, or they see them as promises, excuse me. If you vote for me, I will deliver on the following policy items. A candidate's agenda can change over the course of the primary and presidential campaign because in order to win, candidates try to broaden their appeal and may adopt popular agenda elements of their opponents. This usually happens when a candidate has won the party nomination and needs to win over the supporters of his or her primary challenge. One example of this was in 2016, when Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton adapted her agenda to include elements of Bernie Sanders' campaign, including restructuring the cost of college. And if you look at this flowchart, it kind of points that out. You may have... Um, these promises that you intend to keep and that you want to keep uh, when you first throw your hat in the ring as a presidential nominee. But then somewhere along the way, perhaps you win your primary, you defeat your opponent for the Republican nomination or the uh, Democratic nomination. And so in order to win the uh, votes of the Republican citizens who are going to vote for your opponent, you may need to uh, change some things around um, from what you originally had it and thus winning over them uh, and then from there you uh, you obviously are against the same person on the different party uh, who has probably done the same thing and so you may have to even um, change some things when you're up against the other person that is running for the office uh, so you, you start out in one place and, and hopefully you, you still got most of the promises that you're wanting to keep in mind, but along the way, you're going to have to make some changes. Um, that's just how poli politics works. Let's keep on reading. State of the Union, State of the Agenda. By the time the new president takes office, Americans have a good idea of what they can expect to see in the first State of the Union address. This annual speech to Congress is the traditional time for the president to lay out his or her goals and persuade the members of Congress to work on bills that support these goals. 
I would underline that sentence or highlight it. It can also be used as a warning stating which kind of bills will be vetoed once they reach the president's desk. I would underline that as well. Each year, this speech acts as an opportunity to remind both Congress and the American public of the president's agenda, as well as to continue to put pressure on lawmakers to pass legislation that supports the agenda. Getting the message out just once a year isn't the most effective way of promoting an agenda, so presidents use the media to help keep the conversation going. As the agenda setter, the president could be seen as promoter or spokesperson, holding press conferences, giving interviews, using Twitter and other media outlets to communicate with both the public and Congress about upcoming legislation or the need for action. Now, President Trump is probably the biggest user of Twitter. Uh, I don't remember President Obama using it that much. He was in front of the camera a lot, but um, I don't think he was on social media quite as vocally as uh, President Trump. And then this last paragraph. How important is the agenda? Many say that campaign promises are made to be broken, but political scientists have studied the presidential agendas back to Woodrow Wilson and say that about 75% of those promises are kept. That's a pretty high number, but I mean, obviously 100% would, while impossible, would be ideal. They also found that when the president failed to deliver on an agenda item, it was due to opposition in Congress, not an, not an intentional flip-flop by the president. This is a perfect example of the system of checks and balances in our government. You remember Mr. Offer talking about that. The reason why our government is set up the way it is is that so one person or one group of people will not have all the power. So the president can't just make any law he or she would like. Congress is there to keep him or her in check. The president is there to keep Congress in check. If they make laws that don't match up with his agenda or what he or she thinks is uh, important for this country, they can veto that. Keep them in check. The president can't always get everything he or she wants, and Congress can't legislate without being impacted by both the presidential agenda and the power to veto bills. Um, so, you know, you can at this point um, go over to uh, the executive command game on iCivics um, because that's a good example of trying to get your agenda um, across successfully. I played that game. Uh, for those that were on the Zoom call Tuesday, I talked a little bit about that. Uh, it's kind of a stressful game. I haven't even tried to play it on fast mode. I'm a bit chicken for that. But So at this point, y'all go ahead and uh, uh, pause the video. Y'all can go ahead and work on this part, your activity um, pages. Uh, work on that. If you have any questions, feel free to email Ms. Dockery. Uh, you can email me if you'd like, uh, Matt Wheeler at datecs.org. Um, but pause it here, and then whenever you finish your um, activity sheet, we're going to move on to the next sheet, which is all in the day's work. <music> Coolest job in the country. Imagine you've been elected president of the United States. What do you think would be the best part of the job? Having your own personal jet, Air Force One. Living in the White House. Having a bowling alley in your house. Yes, there's a one-lane bowling alley in the basement of the White House. Being president isn't just fun and games. You have real responsibilities. Below is a list of things you would do as president of the United States. Which do you think would be the hardest to do? Which do you think would be the easiest? Rank the tasks in each list from one being the hardest to three being the easiest. There's no correct answer. Use your own judgment. Okay. Uh, task list A. So in each of these, you rank uh, each of them one to three. I don't know if there's an option for me to, oh, I can annotate. Okay, sweet. So I'm going to do that um, at this point, and I hope that you do it with me. Um, is there like a pen? No, I just draw. Oh, yes. Excellent. All right. Uh, task list A. Lead weekly meetings where I ask the leaders of executive branch departments for advice on how to handle the country's most difficult problems. I don't think that would be too difficult for me. Go to Congress and give my yearly State of the Union speech on what's happening in the U.S., which is broadcast live on television. I, I don't have a problem with stage fright. 
decide whether uh, to approve or reject a bill Congress has sent me that would cut research funding for a serious disease that may uh, that not many people have. Um, I think this would be hard because for me, the hardest for me, oh, this is going to be so difficult. Don't judge my one. Don't judge my numbers as I draw on here, okay? Um, figured it out. All right, there's two. And then this will be three. Three is the easiest for me. Okay. All right. B. Oh, no, I can't. Right. Okay. Well, that's my list. Y'all go ahead and uh, do it without me. All right. So, task list, B, follow, uh, task list B, follow the Constitution and the law, even if I disagree with it. Decide whether to send more troops into war, knowing that some will die, but it will keep the country safe. Make sure the Department of Homeland Security carries out new safety laws at airports, even though I know many travelers will be angry. Um, I think this one would be the easiest. So it, for me, this would be a one, and then two, and then the middle one is probably three, the hardest one. Oh, no, it's the other one around. Okay, so three, two, one. Anyways, y'all go ahead and do that on your own. If I keep on, I'm just going to embarrass myself more. All right, all the days more. Let's keep on reading. The President's Rule Book. The President of the United States is the leader of our nation and the leader of the executive branch of the government. The Constitution of the United States gives all the rules for being a president. It tells who can become president, what powers the president has, and some of the roles and duties that the president takes on. So let's look at some of these. Um, section 1. The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. Before he... Uh, let's see... Before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear, that just means affirm, um, I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States. Doesn't mean murder it, he means I will do the job. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Section 2, the President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States, he may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating due to the duties of their respective offices. And he shall have the power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of, of impeachment. Okay. So he is the head honcho when it comes to our armed services, it specifies army and Navy, because at the time that this was written, there was no Air Force. It could not fly in the 1700s. Um, but at this point, it, it does count as that. Let's keep reading. He shall have power by and with the advice of, and consent of the Senate to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the senators present concur. And he shall nominate, concur just means to agree, and by, and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States. Section 3. He shall, from time to time, give Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. He shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. He shall take, uh, see, he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed and shall commission all the officers of the United States. Um, just this little bit about the um, State of the Union, George Washington had no interest in really speaking to Congress the way that presidents have the past uh, half a century um, or more. Uh, he just wrote a letter to Congress that they would read. From Article 1, Section 7. Every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it becomes a law, be pres uh, presented to the President of the United States. If he approve, he shall sign it. But if not, he shall return it. Uh, lawmaking in the Pres. One of the President's most important functions is not in Article 2. It's in Article 1, which talks about the Congress. The Constitution can be sneaky. That way. The Congress is the lawmaking branch of government. House of Representatives in the Senate. But the Constitution requires the President's approval before a bill can actually become a law. The President either signs a bill to approve it or rejects the bill with a veto. 
and sends it back to Congress. We talked about the checks and balances earlier, right? Um, Congress doesn't have all the power in the nation. They can create laws and whatnot, but it doesn't come into effect until the president signs it. And if he doesn't agree with it, then he doesn't have to sign it. He can veto it. Second in command, the Constitution of the United States gives the president a helper, the vice president. However, the Constitution doesn't say much about what a vice president does, except that the VP is also the president of the Senate, one of the two lawmaking chambers in Congress. But the VP only presides over the Senate to cast a tie-breaking vote or when there is a ceremony. The rest of the time, the vice president advises the president, travels the war world negotiating with other countries, helps carry out laws here at home, and is important to many functions in the executive branch of the government. Mike Pence is our vice president uh, to President Trump. Political party leaders. The president and vice president acts as the leaders of their political party. This role is not part of the Constitution, but has evolved over time as part of the political process. A political party is an organized group of people who share similar views and work to influence the government in support of those views. As party leaders, the president and vice president work to accomplish the party's goals for how the government should address the issues facing our nation. The Republican and Democratic parties are the two major political parties in the U.S. It wasn't always that way. Republican and Democratic parties were not always the, well, they weren't always in existence since the beginning of the United States. Um, there was uh, the Whig Party, for example, which is hilarious to me. Becoming president. In the United States, presidential elections happen every four years. A president cannot serve more than two four-term years, a total of eight years. This rule is found in the uh, 22nd Amendment to the Constitution, which was added in 1951. If a president has only served one term and wants to be reelected, that president ends up spending a lot of time campaigning during the last year of the term. If the president has already served a second term, often the vice president will decide to become a presidential candidate. Many presidents started out as the vice president. Now, before uh, the uh, 22nd Amendment uh, provided that rule that you can only serve twice, there were uh, a number of presidents that did more than two times. Uh, this picture here, uh, President uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected four times. Um, so it, he took office in 1933 and died in office in 1945 during World War II. What if the president dies? So speaking of, there have been several times in the history of the United States where a president has died. When that happens, the Constitution provides that the vice president becomes president. It also gives Congress the power to make a law saying who becomes president if something happened to both president and vice president. Congress did this in the pres Presidential Secession Act, which puts the Speaker of the House, the leader of the House of Representatives, next in line after the vice president and lists everyone who is in line after that. So uh, if something, God forbid, happens to President Trump, uh, Mike Pence would become president and then Nancy Pelosi would be after him. Uh, she would become vice president. So this is the order uh, uh, of the line of secession. The vice president, then the Speaker of the House, this, then the uh, President Pro Tempore of the Senate, Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defense, and then the Attorney General. And then the list continues on with 10 more members of the President's cabinet. All right. So at this point, uh, you've gotten to the activity sheets. Go ahead and work on those. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to direct them to Ms. Dockery. She's probably your best source of information, best source of help, but uh, feel free to reach out to me as well. Again, I hope you guys are doing great. I know this, uh, the stinks that we're having to be in lockdown like this, but hopefully we'll be able to get back together before the end of the school year uh, so I can see your lovely faces lovely-ish faces. So y'all have a fantastic rest of the day.